make sure that I get the confirmation from the robot that we're going. You are recording. All right. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Paul Rouse, who is a visiting fellow in politics and international relations at the University of Southampton. Uh, among the many hats he wears, that's the one that's the one that he's he's joining us today as his in his visiting fellow role. And the the name of the seminar today is it's this is this one's about the antiquated term is geoengineering, which when when uh, Paul and I spoke for the podcast, he corrected me on right away, which is great. And um, and so, but we're we're really talking about um, the uh, the very complex issues of of deliberately intervening in in sort of the Earth's climate systems um, as a as a way to sort of counteract and address. Um, global climate warming in particular. So, uh, Paul, it's great to have you with us today and thank you thank you for joining us and, and away we go. That's great. Well, thanks very much um, for the invitation, Eli. It's very kind of you and it's, uh, I think it's a fascinating module um, that you're doing. Uh, geographies of risk is really interesting and this this is kind of the biggest geography there is in the world. It's uh, it's about the entire planet. Um, I'm going to put up some, put a slide show up. Um, hopefully you can see me as well, but I can't see you, so it's a bit slightly spooky, but there we go. So um, yeah, my name is Paul Rouse. I'm, um, I'm speaking as a visiting fellow of politics and international relations at Southampton University. Um, my day job, my, um, my, my kind of working life, I work for an organisation called the Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative, C2G, which is uh, an initiative of the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs, which is based in New York City. Um, we're not, our, our body is a, a, a distributed organisation, 11 of us in four continents, I think it is. The purpose of C2G is to try and um, catalyze the governance of what we call climate altering technologies, geoengineering, other people call them. I want to be absolutely clear today I'm not speaking on their behalf this is entirely my views um, I'm not representing them anything that they think or don't think about this agenda at all um, this is simply me and I say that because it's important it's a contentious um, space a lot of people um, are extremely concerned about this um, and about the risks associated with it and it's that that I'm going to talk about so I'll say a few words about why we might need geoengineering and I, I'll use geoengineering, but why not? People know what it means. Um, I'm really talking about solar engineering in a specific type. I'll talk about why you might use it and how it might work and then explore some of the risks and benefits, the politics of the governance challenges and what's going on with research um, and the contentions around the risks of research or the risks that don't exist of research and then what might go forward. So firstly, where are we with the climate? Um, I won't say a great deal about this, people are, are aware, but the um, United Nations Environment Programme produces a report called the Emissions Gap Report every year, and it explores how we're getting on in relation to delivering 1.5 to 2 degrees, the agreement of the Paris um, Accords, uh, the goal of the Paris Agreement, I should say. And currently we're firmly on track to deliver a whopping three degrees. Um, we're absolutely nowhere near um, hitting the targets we need to hit. And this includes um, an account for COVID reductions of emissions, which is around about 7% globally, which is a tiny amount. So if we're going to ever reach 1.5 degrees, we're in a situation now where not only do we have to cut emissions, dramatically and rapidly, but we also will have to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as well at the same time, carbon dioxide removal. So when you hear people talking about we're going to go to net zero, what they mean is that we're going to go to a position where the emissions are balanced with removals to a state where a nation state or the world, and it has to be the world, uh, is emitting net no carbon dioxide. Now this is an enormous challenge. The emissions reductions measures alone, which are critical, and none of what I say diminishes the need for those. Um, they're huge. The removals rates that are required are quite staggering. So um, if you look at the, the IPCC um, report on 1.5 degrees, 
described how do we get to 1.5 degrees. It has four or five scenarios in there, and those scenarios all show that you have to remove carbon dioxide, and somewhere between 100 billion and 1,000 billion tonnes need to be removed in the next 79 years um, if we're going to stay between uh, stay under 1.5 which is an enormous amount. Every time you hear this number, you just think, oh, God, that's big. Um, it's almost impossible to describe how big it is. Uh, it's about 19 billion Titanics, the ship, not the film. Um, it's something like, if you took the weight of double-decker buses, um, it's something like um, enough double-decker buses lined up back to back to go to the moon and back um, multiple times. It's a huge weight. And we have a problem because we need carbon dioxide removal, but, there are no approaches currently available that are, are ready to operate at scale. So we do have an issue. How do you remove the carbon dioxide? I'm not going to go through this slide in detail because we don't have time. But it, uh, and I can share these slides um, afterwards. That's fine. I'll send them to Eli and you can look at them if you're interested. Just taking afforestation and reforestation, people talk of the need to plant billions of trees to help address climate change. Trees are great beautiful things, wonderful and lovely. We all love trees and we want to see more of them, good. However, the idea that this is a nature-based solution is, is nonsense. Um, it's a nature-based approach and as part of a mixture of other activities, it will be very helpful. But the, the most uh, modelling suggests that could be removed by trees um, globally by 2050 is 18 gigatons. Bearing in mind, we need to remove somewhere between 100 gigatons and 1,000, you can see the problem. To achieve that 18 gigatons, you'd need to cover 1.2% of the land surface of the planet every year. So by 2100, 96% of the Earth's surface is covered by trees. And that's slightly problematic because you want to grow food and have somewhere to live and have other activities. And it's also a millennial scale issue. The trees die. And when trees die, they release carbon dioxide, nitrous oxides, methanes, and so on. So it's a problem. And the same applies for different reasons around various different types of carbon dioxide removal. Uh, direct air capture ocean fertilization is one form of geoengineering that's discussed, BECS, um, bioengineering carbon capture removal, and so on. There are shortages and shortfalls if we use them all to their maximum capacity. So if you modeled this up, you get to a maximum theoretical capacity from the literature, and this is from a paper actually I, I produced last year, uh, takes you to 56 gig gigatons, just over 56 gigatons per annum by 2050. That's clearly going to be insufficient and it would have major impacts. And DAX would need four times the current global solar and wind power just to power it. Um, it's problematic. So that starts people thinking about what else might we do? And I'm going to be talking about one type of solar radiation modification. Solar radiation modification, or it's also called solar radiation management, um, which has interesting implications for um, how we think about it. It's managerial, it's a control system rather than a modification, and that has deep meanings for people around this issue, which is probably surprising, I think. It's also called solar engineering um, and geoengineering. Geoengineering is a catch-all phrase, but people generally apply it to solar radiation modification and not CDR. So the idea of this is very simple. You reflect sunlight away from the Earth's surface, um, act as a sunshade, and that addresses a symptom of climate change. That's the heat. And you don't need to reflect an enormous amount of sunlight away to have a large scale effect. So 1% reduction in sunlight would be expected to offset all of the anthropogenic warming that's been experienced to date. And that's between 1 and 1.1 degrees currently. So if you can find a way of reflecting 1%, you have the theoretical capacity to cool the Earth system in a managed way. And this raises extraordinary questions and issues. So how do you do that? What are the different approaches? There are a number that are being discussed in the literature. This isn't a new idea by any means. There's been detailed research and modeling on SRM for uh, 20 years. and uh, it's consistently shown that certain types could solve a problem. So the various types on the agenda, um, surface albedo modification, uh, basically that means putting um, shiny surfaces on the su surface of the planet to reflect sunlight away. 
So people talk about painting roofs white or putting reflective membranes in um, low populated areas such as deserts with a view to reflecting light and cooling. Unfortunately, there are significant problems with this. Firstly, painting roofs white requires a lot of materials and you need so many materials, the carbon um, density of the materials required would offset any capacity to cool through the solar radiation modification. If you would use membranes in desert, you have to manufacture them. These things would be very, very large uh, and keep them clean and you would need water resources and it, they very quickly become very problematic. So very few people are now working on this. There is some work looking at putting foams uh, and beads um, on sea and ice um, as reflective surfaces, and they have a lot of issues associated with those. A lot of these are kind of theoretical thinking exercises. Uh, cirrus cloud thinning is theoretical um, and, and not a, there hasn't been a great deal of work done on this. Um, very little work in terms of risk assessment and governance. Uh, uh, more on the theoretical physics, atmospheric chemistry uh, and so on. The idea of this is to simply to, to thin the cirrus clouds, which allows more heat to escape. Uh, marine cloud brightening. This is something that has been researched in some detail, again, in modeling um, studies. The basic principle is that if you can enhance the number of condensing nuclei in a cloud, you generate a brighter cloud because you get a coalescence around the particle, which makes a larger surface and it's more reflective. That uh, could be done by injecting um, salt water, simple salt particles into appropriate clouds. This will be done over the oceans. It is um, clearly theoretically uh, possible to do this. It would be unlikely to be used as a global um, approach to cooling the Earth system. You'd need vast numbers of ships doing this, presumably solar powered, um, uh, and they would need to be distributed around the globe. And you don't have a, a consistent supply of the right sort of clouds. However, people are working on it, um, and there's a lot of conversation around the idea of doing this for uh, regional cooling. So in Australia, the um, Australian government and Queensland have a live research project looking at using marine cloud brightening to cool uh, above the Great Barrier Reef to protect against uh, mass bleaching effects. And they actually undertook an experiment, an outdoors experiment, the first ever solar radiation modification experiment in the world last year in April. It was simply a test to see if they could spray particles at the right size um, at the right density in a very small um, sample. And it wasn't an attempt to actually brighten the clouds, it's testing the spraying kit. But that went ahead and it's still on the agenda um, in Australia. The last one is stratospheric aerosol injection. This is the one that's the most um, contentious and also likely to be the intervention that is most likely to deliver the objectives of cooling the Earth system. So what is it? Uh, it's injecting or spraying reflective aerosols into the stratosphere, which immediately sounds a little bit cracky. The idea is that you use um, smaller particles um, distributed broadly, and because of the way the stratosphere works, this is between around about 7 and 15 kilometres the injection would take place, the aerosol would distribute evenly over the Earth's surface and cool globally. And it would be able to cool very quickly. If you think of when you step under a shade in the summer on a hot day, you're cooled quite quickly. The same would happen with stratospheric aerosol injection. You, you would get rapid cooling. So it would be perfectly possible to cool the entire Earth system within a year, a measurable cooling. That's not to say by degrees, but a measurable cooling. And you could cool the Earth system by significant temperatures. I mean, all temperatures are significant, but, but climate relevant climate change relevant temperatures very quickly. Equally, it could be extremely cheap. But, uh, it's estimated that you could halve global warming to date at a cost of 2.25 billion a year. Uh, 2.25 billion is a lot of money in, uh, in individual's terms, but for a nation state, uh, UK spent, I think it's 250 billion on COVID this year so far. 2.25 isn't an enormous amount. And it's actually quite cheap compared with the costs of emissions reductions and carbon dioxide removal. That's not to say it's a replacement for those, but it, it gives you a sense of the scale of the cost. 
How effective it, is it? Uh, very. One kilogram of sulfate would uh, have a cooling effect to offset the warming of several hundred thousand tons or kilograms, I should say, of CO2. So it is a powerful forcing effect. And it could be very um, simply, but it can be fine tuned. You can adjust the amount of aerosol that's injected to have uh, control over the temperature increases and reductions you might want to see. How do we know this stuff might work? Well, there are natural examples of this. Volcanic eruptions um, cool the climate. We know this, it's been seen, it's modeled, it's an effect that has um, a, a, a very kind of robust understanding in modeling. And if you think about Mount Pinatubo, this erupted in 1991, ejected 30 megatons of sulfate aerosol into the atmosphere. And that cooled the global climate globally by half a degree for two years. Other eruptions have, have been shown to have the same effect. So we know the injection of particulates into the stratosphere would work. Um, we have evidence for that and it provides useful data for modeling. And the modeling of Aerosols in the atmosphere is something that has been worked on not only for stratospheric aerosols and volcanoes, but work is done for climate modeling generally um, because aerosols have a cooling and effect on the uh, climate. So you need to factor that in when you're looking at global warming generally, and you'll see a lot of work on that in IPCC reports. How do you do this? In principle, um, you would fly aircraft to deliver the aerosols into the stratosphere. Currently, aircraft capable of flying at that height with sufficient payload aren't available. Certainly, aircraft can fly uh, in the stratosphere, but they can't take sufficient weight. However, the engineering studies that are being undertaken looking at engineering um, new aircraft that may be capable to, of doing this are suggesting that it's, um, it's not simple, but it's a relatively normal engineering research development exercise. Um, papers that came out a couple of weeks, months, weeks ago, months ago, was suggesting it would cost about four billion pounds to develop aircraft that could do this. So you have a, a, an idea, and it's no more than that at the moment, that you might be able to cool the Earth system um, quickly, very cheaply, uh, with control, using well-known technologies, um, not requiring large scale new um, evolutions of um, the global economies um, or economics. So it has, you know, it's, it is appealing to some people for sure. What it, you shouldn't think of this in terms of a substitute though for emissions reductions or for carbon dioxide removal. And it's really important not to forget this. This diagram is called the napkin diagram because it was, it was drawn on a napkin in a bar um, by John Shepard, who is a Southampton University academic. He was the director of the National Oceanographic Centre um, down on the on the seafront. Uh, you guys will probably know it. Um, and John's been involved in um, geoengineering issues for, for, for 10, 20 years. Um, he was actually my supervisor for my PhD as well, which I did at Southampton, finished off about three years ago. So he's a you have a relationship of previous supervisors. Um, so the idea then is that we have here a graph representing how you might use SRM, stratospheric aerosol. The red line business as usual. This is the linear um, description of global warming, increased CO2, the temperature goes up. So if you cut emissions aggressively, which is absolutely essential, you will bring the curve down. But you won't be able to bring it down low enough to reach the temperatures so that the global community has decided that uh, are appropriate, the maximum warming we should be willing to um, experience. But you can cool by re re reducing emissions. And then you can reduce a little bit more with carbon dioxide removal. But the problem we have is, as I mentioned at the outset, currently there is no um, CDR techniques that are capable of cooling the earth um, quickly enough um, or at scale. There are decadal to multi-decadal timescale projects to get them up to speed to be able to cool. And then the cooling will take a long time. So you have this gap. Um, and the idea is that you use SRM to, to take the top of 
that that curve you sort of taking the top off the um, boiled egg if you will and you cool the earth system for a period of time whilst you're able to ramp up uh, CDR and emissions of cuts at the such time as you reach the temperature you would wish to, you then slow down and stop SRM. So that's the model. It's not to cool the Earth system um, and not worry about other activities. It's simply as a tool to avoid the overshoots. So this all sounds like good news, yeah? Um, you can cool the Earth system and it might be the only way humanity can um, avoid catastrophic climate change for every single human being on the planet, which actually prima facie sounds pretty good. Uh, a solution to the largest problem that humanity has ever faced. Um, if you listen to uh, David Attenborough when he spoke to the Security Council earlier on this week, or if you want to listen to Bill Gates, indeed, he said the same thing. Um, and you know, it's something then we should think about, perhaps. You would slow ice loss at the poles, uh, you would stop sea level rise, and it could be very beneficial for biodiversity. A big problem for climate change uh, for biodiversity is the speed of change. If you slow that change, um, or indeed stop the change, it gives biodiversity, fauna and flora, time to adapt in a way that isn't um, available with rapid climate change. So that sounds all good stuff, and let's go do it, right? But there are serious problems and issues associated with this. Firstly, this this is modeling. This, you know, be frank and honest, it's only modeling and models can be wrong um, and they can be uh, seriously wrong. So without a more detailed study, you should be extremely cautious. If you were to use sulfates, and that's most definitely the most favored um, currently particle to use, sulfate would have or at least potentially would have effects on the ozone layer a five megaton deployment would reduce ozone by about four and a half percent this is not good news <laughs> uh, ozone is absolutely essential for the maintenance of human life and all life on on the planet it cuts out um, ultraviolet that is something that has to be taken extremely seriously. Um, some may suggest you can have a, a small amount of reduction. Montreal Protocol is delivering very, very well. Um, others would say this is completely bonkers. Of course, you shouldn't do this. Stratospheric aerosol injection could also affect precipitation. Some scenarios, and there are different injection scenarios, different volumes, different locations in the planet to start with, and then they distribute. Some would deliver drying in some areas and some wetting, so you get more rainfall or less rainfall, and that would happen in different places. So this creates really difficult decisions. Do you want to choose to allow some places to get drier or some places to get wetter? Because globally you get a, a, a better outcome for a larger number of people, or you may get one. It could also affect ocean circulation and that, that's true for climate change as well, um, but it would do it in slightly different ways, perhaps. And you have the problem of what on earth happens to all this stuff that you're shoving into the stratosphere. And of course, what goes up must come down. So the sulfates de would deposit on the Earth's surface. It doesn't just float off into space, it comes down. That isn't perhaps as large a problem an issue as it might appear uh, because Firstly, the volume is rather small. It isn't a vast amount in the Earth system terms that's being put up there. And it's small in comparison with the um, uh, industrial pollution, the sulfates that we're already putting up. And importantly, when it falls out, um, industrial sulfate pollution falls out quite close by to where it's produced. It's in the troposphere and it falls out in three, four, five days. Um, stratospheric aerosols will remain lofted for periods of years, but they will fall out evenly across the entire Earth's surface. So in terms of pollutants for human well-being and um, interspecies ethics and the well-being of other species, it might be slightly better news and it's distributed globally. But then, of course, it'll be falling on pristine areas as well. But in terms of the likely death, and you have to be blunt about this, it would kill people. Um, the number of deaths would be tiny in comparison with the number of deaths that could be avoided by deploying the and technology or technique 
um, and cooling the Earth system. So it's a balanced judgment, but it's an important issue. And of course, it wouldn't affect ocean acidification. If you deploy stratospheric aerosols, carbon dioxide is still being emitted. And the scenario I described, um, carbon dioxide would be coming down, but still being emitted. The oceans would continue to acidify. So it doesn't solve all problems. And you have unknown unknowns. So is this governed? Currently not, no. There are no international instruments or um, laws or regulations that would stop people doing this. Anyone, any country could decide that they would quite happily go off and um, intervene in the Earth system for all of humanity and um, it'll all be jolly good and fine. And that's a problem. And governance and risk governance is the huge big challenge around this space. So there are a range of instruments that kind of apply, might apply, could apply in a way. Um, Montreal Protocol protects the ozone layer. Stratospheric aerosol injection might harm the ozone layer. There may be an inter interrelationship between those, um, but currently it wouldn't apply. The Convention on Biological Diversity is interesting. It um, discourages geoengineering, all geoengineering approaches that affect biodiversity. Some people say it's a moratorium. The the wording in the annexes uh, and the decisions, um, I could give people decision numbers if they want. It's really great. Very exciting if you're into this stuff. Uh, but they talk about, um, uh, not, not about moratoriums, but about encouraging people to think and not do this and, and language that's relatively soft for conventions. Paris Agreement, you could actually argue, could justify the use of stratospheric aerosols because it's a way of achieving the goals of the agreement. You can call the system. So no laws that can apply and it creates massive hard problems. And these are the risk issues that need to be resolved. Firstly, the geography of this risk. We're talking about every single living person, every single animal, all fauna and flora. And it is a, a, a decision that would be taken intentionally to do that, to affect it. That has never happened before. It's, it's quite unique. So who decides how to do this? and when and for what purpose? Who has the legitimacy to do these things? Does the UN? It's not what they're for. Who sets this thermostat and controls it? How do you deal with what we call mitigation deterrence or moral hazard? There's a danger that if you started to use this technology, people would see it as a fabulous opportunity to sit back and think, oh, look, it works if it worked. We seem to be getting on quite well. We haven't all died. We haven't had a major catastrophe. Let's just step back a bit from our emissions reductions and our carbon dioxide removal. We can relax a bit, give ourselves more time. And that would be dangerous. Firstly, you have the problems of ocean acidification ongoing. You have the issue that you will continually have to conduct the stratospheric aerosol injection. And that is problematic in terms of long-term security. And also carbon dioxide affects the climate in a way that's slightly different to the way in which solar radiation affects the climate. So you would have two types of effect happening. There are long-term security issues about SAI. If you were to use it and then stop quickly, you get a thing called a termination effect. So you're under your sombrero, under your shade, you take it away and you get hot very quickly. And the same would happen to the global Earth system. There would be a termination effect by the temperature would return very rapidly to the temperature it would have been had there been no stratospheric aerosol injection. If that's been combined with moral hazard, whereby the uh, parts per million of CO2 have actually gone up, not down, then you could have a large increase in temperature and it could be very quick and that could be very damaging. So how do you govern that? How do you mitigate the risk of this happening? And there's quite a lot of um, thought has gone into this in terms of political science, um, science technology studies guys, geographers and so on. Um, broadly, people have a sense that it would be difficult to imagine why that might ever be allowed to happen. Why would the global community allow this to happen? But it could. You then have the geopolitics and the global security issues around this. At 2.25 billion a year, it could be done by a single lone state. The United States could choose to do this. Russia could do it. The EU could choose to do this and so on. 
and there's nothing currently legally to stop them. But beyond that, clubs of small states might potentially come together to do this. They might feel it's a tool. It's actually a bargaining chip. Don't use this, but develop it and threaten to use the technology because low lying states with sea level rise are under threat. Perhaps they may feel if we were to use this technique, we could frighten people into actually doing something significant about emissions reductions in the CDR. And there's also even suggestion that you could have a sort of green finger character, a little bit like the James Bond baddies, you know, gold finger and so on. But somebody, a wealthy individual or a collective of wealthy individuals who choose to take this forward. So you think of you know, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, um, Gates and so on. All of these scenarios have um, real questions around them. Is it likely that one or two or three rich, super rich people are going to choose to try and change the Earth system? I think, frankly, highly unlikely, but it could happen. And you need to have a governance framing around this to manage the risk of that happening. Then there's a real question about, you know, can we actually have a conversation about this? Is it possible to have a global dialogue about a technique like this? Certainly at the moment, it would be virtually impossible. And how would you engage people, bring them in? Who would you bring in? Um, levels of understanding and knowledge of this are very, very low. So there would need to be a significant effort to increase those. There are a lot of politics about the governance of the risks here as well. You know, who pays for this? It's an ongoing commitment because termination shock effects, you have to continue to support this until sometime that you start to taper off the injection. So who pays um, and how is that payment guaranteed moving forward? Within global politics, it's very common to see um, countries who've committed to long term programs of investment withdrawing. We saw that um, with the US government last year with withdrawals from WHO, um, briefly the Paris Agreement and so on. And then who gets handed the capacity to do this? Who are we going to trust to manage our climate to affect us all? What effect might it have on climate negotiations? Are there dangers and risks associated with that? Indeed, what might happen um, in the Security Council if one of the permanent members were to choose to use this technique? It could be very, very dangerous indeed. There would be leadership competition perhaps over this. You can imagine some uh, macho uh, Politicians, we can think of Putin and Trump and so on and, and Brazil, thinking this is a great way I can show the people how great and powerful I am. And it can reframe the way we think about the entire global um, economy, if you will. Stratospheric aerosols could be seen as a way of pr prolonging a, an unsustainable system um, of material consumption that is destroying the planet. Or it could be seen as a fabulous tool to get some capitalism out of a crisis. Uh, you also have risk risk issues and questions which are difficult to resolve. Um, the precautionary principle becomes um, problematic. You have a risk of using stratospheric aerosols causing harm, and you have a risk of not addressing climate change and causing harm, and resolving those things is difficult. So there's a kind of flavour of some of the issues and, and concerns around this. I've talked a lot about evidence and the evidence and where the science is going. And this is really where at the moment the debate about the risks is at. And it's a very live conversation. It's been going on a long time, but um, day by day, this is um, heating up and it's becoming uh, interesting to well, sad people like me who get off on this stuff at least. Um, so as the science out, 20 years of modelling, as I've suggested, and a lot of governance scholarship amongst a very small community of um, individuals entirely, that's not true, almost entirely um, scholars in the global west. The vast majority of those uh, white men, uh, and actually quite a lot of them have beards. This is a small little group. It's called a geo clique, and that's a problem. There's a lot of kind of introspection, groupthink, um, and a danger of that. And people within it are conscious of it, but it's very difficult to break out. You've got to bring new people in. Research funding has been limited. Uh, 32 million has been spent by US, India and Japan 
Um, the UK has actually put quite a lot of money into this as well. They're one of the larger funders. And there's work going on um, in Australia, Canada, China, Finland, EU. But as you can see, those countries, India has a small program, China. Actually, China has is gearing up and it could well have an enormous program. They're, they have a vast program on weather modification now, um, which suggests they might be thinking in moving in these spaces. But, so we have a knowledge base, but it's very small and needs to be larger. But the knowledge base is at a point now where we have to face the big question. And that is, do we do an outdoors experiment? Is it time to go outside into the atmosphere, into the world and have a have a tweak to sort of go and see what you can do and see what happens? And this is a, a seriously problematic issue for multiple reasons. If firstly, it's contentious because there's no way of actually not allowing it to happen. Current research governance um, is framed in a very uh, messy way. It's a complex polycentric sort of patchwork of different um, tools to govern researchers' activities. And a lot of those are very soft. They're codes of conduct and learning society um, uh, issue uh, messages about integrity research funders have um, research integrity statements that one is supposed to comply with but they're not rules as such and there are no rules globally to stop you doing this so there's a problem in that sense that people are worried that certain researchers and there are individuals who are, are being kind of pointed at for this unfairly in my view very unfairly um, but it it it's it's problematic. And one of the reasons it, it causes concern is firstly, people have this worry that the climate's going to change because somebody does an experiment. That's frankly foolish. The scale of the experiments is tiny, and I'll say a few words about that. But there's real concern about the slippery slope. And that is the idea that if you start, if you go and start doing something outdoors, it inevitably snowballs and you'll end up with a change in the climate through the research activity. Now that's an interesting argument. It sounds quite plausible, um, but I think you need to balance that argument against the idea that, well, firstly, the research has been going on for 20 years. Is that not a slippery slope? And the caution around the idea of outdoors experimentation amongst the community now, I think reflects the consciousness of the, the, the issues and the challenges of this technique. But there's a slippery slope that goes in the other direction if you were to stop um, any further progress in this space, you lose the opportunity to do this. And there's an argument that it is a, a tool that you might want in the back pocket as an emergency response to crime, climate crisis. If you, if you stop outdoor experimentation, do you stop the research? Do you stop the conversation? Do you lose that opportunity, perhaps? There's a lot of nervousness within the governance community about this, um, and this goes back quite a long way. Now, if you talk to people within the policy community uh, about their views on whether this should be considered and taken forward in the process of deliberation and joint consideration, you'll normally get a response that is very cautious. And I've personally heard uh, people, people directly said to me, if I talk about this publicly, it will be career suicide. I cannot do this. That's very slowly changing. I think people are now saying, I don't want to talk about this publicly. Our institution can't be seen to be talking about this publicly. But tell us a little bit about it. We'll, we'll just, you know, have you got a bit of briefing you can just perhaps share with us? So there's a change. And I think that's because people are beginning to recognise how hard it will be to get to net zero. So when is the next experiment going to happen? When are we going to have a deployment? What's actually happening in the science? I'm just going to talk about two experiments, then I'll finish, I'll wrap up. The first one, this um, started in 2010. This is what got me personally interested in this space. I was I worked in the research councils as a research funder in the UK. It's called UKRI now. I, I used to work in the Economic and Social Research Council. Um, where I looked after energy, food, and um, environmental research. 
The Natural Environment Research Council, ESRC and EPSRC, that's the Physical Sciences, the Natural Sciences and the Social Sciences Research Councils, funded a project. We had a, a gathering in a hotel. This is called an ideas um, project, ideas program project. And the idea is you bring people together into a hotel, they spend a week there, they're selected from application and they come together as an interdisciplinary team to construct a research project or projects to address a question. And the framing of this question was geoengineering. It used the G word, which is this word that we try not to use because it has such extraordinary responses. At the end of that week, uh, a project was identified. This is done in competition within the community in this hotel. There's about 30 or 40 people and they form various teams and it evolves over time to get to a point where you have a project. They decided to do this project, it was funded, and it comprised three elements, some modelling, some public engagement study to ask people, what do you think about the ideas of doing this, and a test bed. And the test bed caused considerable um, concern in the public. The test bed was described as a geoengineering project. What the test bed wanted to do was loft a um, balloon to one kilometre, it would be about 60 foot long and underneath the balloon was going to be a hose pipe out of which the plan was to spray 100 kilograms of water. It's half a bath full of water, pumped up a hose, squirted out the back. This is not geoengineering as we might understand it, this is spraying water out of a hose pipe. However, it caused considerable concern because it was framed as being a geoengineering experiment. There was a very significant campaign against this, against geoengineering and this project specifically. It was the tool for those who wanted to campaign against the agenda to kind of hook onto because it was called geoengineering. Um, and it was a very successful campaign. Uh, the Secretary of State for Environment was drawn into this. The Convention on Biological Diversity were meeting at the time this campaign um, was undertaken and it affected their thinking and you can see that in the way the convention has changed and evolved. Newspapers of course picked up on this, it was in on the red tops, it was in the Guardian, um, on the news and the radio and so on and it was described as being a geoengineering project rather than a pipe with some water spraying out the back. The controversy was such that the test bed was the, the experiment was delayed for six months whilst more public engagement was undertaken and then it was delayed again and then it was cancelled. I worked in the research council for over 20 years, it's the first project I ever saw rescinded uh, because of a, a public response and when you bear in mind that body funds uh, seven billion pounds worth of research a year and research is GMOs, it researches stem cells research, um, for the, this to be the project that was rescinded and the only one I saw of hundreds and hundreds of projects, I found that quite extraordinary. That rumbled on that debate and it, it is the it's got a touchstone conver uh, conversation point regularly in this space. But the science has moved on and we're now in a fascinating space. The Stratospheric Control Perturbation Experiment, SCOPEX, is a project uh, being developed at Harvard University by the Kutch Group and it involves the um, the world's leading um, scientist in this field but by some way an outstandingly uh, a brilliant scientist. The idea behind this experiment is to explore what might happen if you were to distribute some sulfates um, to the chemistry in the stratosphere and particularly what might be going on in terms of how the particles that you distribute work and what they might do interacting with other things such as the ozone. So the idea of the project is to take a balloon that's steerable, go up to the stratosphere to fly this along and distribute a very small amount of material, initially calcium carbonate which is chalk um, and then possibly sulfates one kilogram to five kilograms is the, the volume that's being discussed, I believe. Having sprayed this, the gondola would be flown back through the plume to undertake measurements. So it has uh, instruments underneath the gondola suspended from a balloon. When you bear in mind the average commercial aircraft, thousands of which are in the air at any one time, produce one kilogram of sulfur 
a minute spraying five kilograms of sulfur isn't uh, an enormous contribution to the, um, the atmospheric load of sulfur. However, it is highly contentious. A um, advisory group, independent advisory group, has been set up to manage the governance of this, and that body immediately came under attack because, firstly, because it was uh, solely comprised of American citizens, which uh, at least uh, people working and living in the United States. That was expanded sensibly. This is a global um, agenda. It needs to be globally inclusive. The chair of that body um, stood down because of pressures that were applied to them um, for various reasons. And we're now at a situation after several years of talking about whether this might take place. It's been suggested that uh, experiment will take place in June in Krina in Sweden in the Northern Arctic. The plan of the experiment is to loft the balloon, take it up and see if it can be steered and then come back down. There's no intention to use the instruments and certainly no intention to deploy or spray anything. It's simply a flight test. The decision as to whether this should happen or not was due to be taken by the advisory committee on the 16th of February and we haven't heard anything been no news. Um, there are the same kind of game playing is going on that happened around SPICE. Um, similar points of view from various parties, both those pro and those against. And it's uh, it's almost as if it's just gone round in Groundhog Day. Now, I find this extraordinary that the risk of this experiment, the danger that arises from it is that the balloon crashes and hits someone on the head. That's basically all that could go wrong as far as I can understand and yet it is causing global concern. Last year, scientists launched over 300 stratospheric balloons. So this isn't you know, especially different, but it's causing crisis. So there we are. That's all I was going to talk about, really. What do we do? Where are we going to go? Uh, do we play God or are we going to stand back? Is the risk worth it to potentially solve the challenge of climate change or is it too frightening? What do we do? This is, in my view, the first test of the Anthropocene. It's the first time in recognition of our global control of the Earth system that we need to make a decision of what to do. Personally, my view now is we have to have a dialogue. It's got to be inclusive. We need education. We need learning. But I now believe, and I've come to this in the last few weeks, that the Scopex experiment should go ahead, certainly the one that's proposed, because it will give us a platform to discuss and currently that's not there, and it will for sure open up the whole debate globally. So there's some references here, the references for the material that appeared in the slides, but also some reading. I can recommend to you, while I'm not talking on C2G's behalf, that we've got a lot of information about this, a lot of evidence briefs and policy briefs, both about carbon dioxide removal and solar radiation modification, and a lot of webinars with um, lectures and materials, uh, campfire chat conversations, there's 40 or so of those online as well. And you can find that at c2g.net, or just Google C2G environment, you'll find it. So there we are, I'll finish there. My contacts are available. I'd love to talk to people, email me if you'd like to, phone me, whatever, because um, I'm a bit of a nerd and I like it. I'll ha with that hand back, if I can work out how to do it, to Eli. Thanks so much. That was fantastic. And I I wish I wish we had more time for questions. People are going to have to move on for teaching responsibilities at one, I'm afraid. But it was just it's a it's it's great to see it it laid out as you lay it out. And um and I I do encourage people, you know, who've watched it live and and people who may watch it in recorded form um to take you up on your offer to to get in touch. Um but this is thank you so much for your contribution this afternoon. And I'm sorry, I went on a bit again. I just seen the time and just realized <laughs> right. it's all right. I think if apologies people have questions, to the audience. I, unfortunately, you know, hope not to disappoint anyone. But if people have questions, they can I'll encourage them to get in touch. And um, but otherwise, this will on we go. That's great. Thanks, Eli. I've enjoyed it. It's good fun. Thanks so much. Good. Appreciate it. Paul. As well. OK, <laughs> just bye. Thanks for that. Thank you, Paul. No, no, no problem at all. Yeah. <laughs>